Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Item 13, an African food podcast, and I'm your host, Yom Tego. Every other week, we'll delve into the world of African food, including chefs, curators, and bloggers. Here's the show. Welcome to Item 13, Maria. It's great to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about all things uh, Sierra Union food and um, the topic of the day, fine dining. Um, I have some thoughts, so it'll be interesting to see what your <laughs> take is um, and all that good stuff. So let's kick off by you telling us a little bit about Maria. Who is Maria? Um, where did you grow up? Um, how did you um, end up where you are today? Well, my name is Maria Bradford. I was born and raised in Sierra Leone and I left Sierra Leone when I was about 18. Um, came to the UK to um, continue my education. Um, I studied an accounting um, degree and um, worked in finance and um, accounting roles for local authorities for about 10, 10 years. but. Um, Cooking has always been like, you know, my thing. I I think I started cooking, to be honest, when I was about nine. Yeah, I think we all did, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, just my going to work and saying, can you cook the rice? Or can yeah. you make sure this is ready? Can you make sure that's ready. So, but that, that's me, really. Um, came to the UK, um, studied um, in Kent, actually. I went to, oh, cool. I lived in um, somewhere called West Marlin, mm-hmm. um for a bit and then went to school in um, Tunbridge and then um, attended Kent University. Um, after that, I had a graduate job for with the local authority, um, Medway Council in Kent and worked with them for about 10 years. And oh, wow. then my husband, um, who I met at uni, um, he's English, born and raised in um, Kent, um, after I finished, because he was kind of in Kent, we moved in together um, in 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 um, Chatham somewhere, and um, later settled in um, just he's he's local really um, yeah um, yeah and and uh, but we we got married like sixteen um, fifteen years ago um, oh and wow. It, it, yeah, oh, I feel that's so a... old. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's like that's an achievement to be married for fifteen years. That's that's great. That's that's yeah, great. Yeah, as my daughter would say, because we've been we've been together for seventeen years and we've been married for fifteen years, and she usually goes to me, "Mom, that was quick." I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you "Know you know." <laughs> right, and you know you know. <laughs> that's great, and it's so funny that you say that um, you started as an out as an accountant and worked in finance because that's sort of like my path also and and quite a few people I've interviewed um have also been have also sort of followed that path of setting out as accounting or finance and then somehow fi- found themselves in in the food world so how did you like what was the turning point or what was the moment where you decided okay I was done with um accounting or working in finance um and then switching to food well 
all the while, while I was actually working, I always used to um, do just events, but on a very low key basis, mm. just part time. And um, I used to make the chili sauce and I, the whole chili sauce thing started because my my daughter, who is now 14, doesn't eat any spice. Um, <laughs> Seriously, her palate is ridiculous. She wouldn't, the slightest, even ginger, she complains. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I started making a chili sauce because my husband and I love chili. Mm. And um, my colleagues at work loved it. So I started taking it bit by bit into the office and selling it. And um, every time I'm at work eating something, you know, my colleagues will be like, oh, can I try some? Mm -hmm. And I'll take a little bit at work. Um, and selling my chili sauce at the same time. And then when we have like Christmas functions, they will always ask me to do the food. And if family members have events, I always end up being the one catering for the whole yeah. event and that. But I will actually say my aha moment and that kind of came, um, a cousin of mine came um, from um, Liberia um, to have a baby here. And mm -hmm. she wanted to have a baby shower. Um, she invited about 25 people to the baby shower and asked me to to cater. But she wanted something quite specific. She wanted like an afternoon tea with um, an African influence okay. um, to, to it. So all the nibbles and all the little um, um, desserts and that um, I ended up doing and having to bring African ingredients into the whole thing. After the event, um, a lot of people that were there started asking me for my card. <laughs> and asking me if I run events. And I'm like, no, no, I don't. I just do this for fun. This is how yeah. I'm always in. And um, I'm like, my husband's family think I'm crazy because I, I cook every day. Um, absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I used to get home from work um, just to make lunch, pack lunch for my daughter. <laughs> and she goes to, seriously, she used to go to school and people would be like, what is your mom packed today? <laughs> Like you're the fanciest little girl at the nursery. <laughs> but it's good because she eats everything. So now she's yeah. really good. Um, but that's just how um that came about. And after that, because everyone was going on about it, and there was a girl um that she invited, actually, she came all the way from America, um, that um darling. She um she was really pushing because I didn't know much about Instagram or anything, but mm -hmm. she said Listen, Maria, I really, really think some of these pictures that we've taken today, you should post it on your, Inst you should open an Instagram page and um, you should post these pictures. And I was like, oh my God, I've never used Instagram before. <laughs> and they were like, so when everyone's gone, spoke to my um, then 11 year old, she knew more about Instagram than I did. And um, <laughs> she, she helped me set up my Instagram page and I posted. And because I had, I've had, I used to just take pictures of food and mm. on my, it was all on my phone. So I started posting those old pictures and then pictures of that event. And it just grew from there. Yeah. Um, and then um, the chili sauce that I've been selling, I started doing home labels and doing farmer's markets with it at the weekend when I'm not working. Um, but the, and I, I just, from there, I just thought, do you know what? I, I think I should give this a, a proper yeah. go because the take on it was absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, I had so many comments and so many people sending me DMs on my Instagram. <laughs> it's amazing. This is a, where are you based? Have you got a restaurant? And I thought, okay, okay. This is yeah. Because so I, I, yeah. I also thought I read somewhere too that you also ended up going to a, go, doing a formal program, right? Like a, um, you did a food and wine. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was quite recent because um, oh, okay. uh, again, it's the, it's the, yeah, the, I would say it's the African in me because I felt like to, to do what I was doing for as a job, I mm -hmm. had to go to uni. I had to study to do that. I realized if I'm going to call myself a chef, I needed to go and do some course to make um, sure that. Yeah, when that's I definitely the African in me. <laughs> it is the African in me because actually I realized when I was there, I spoke to this school. It's a really fancy school in London. I spoke to them and um, I said, what do you need to do to start a food catering business? And they looked at me as if I was mad. She just mm. went, nothing. You absolutely don't have to do anything anyone can run a food business. Right. I'm like, really? Really? So you don't have to, what about if I want to call myself a chef? What do I need to do? What qualifications do I need? And they're just like, 
no, you don't have to do anything. But I think what really got me also and it was when I turned up at the school, which I was really intimidated because um, mm. they've had lots of famous um, chefs um, from uh, this uh, lead. Um, what really got me was the fact that the principal was like, I'm so intimidated because I've seen your page. When a oh. uh, student leave here, they want to achieve what you're doing already. Um, and you, the way you're doing this, it's, we've never had someone who've done it this way. People come here to learn to cook. They don't, they don't know how to cook <laughs> and then turn up I'm like, oh, well, I still need to learn the classics because um, I think that's really, I still wanted to, to learn the classics. I want to know, that, you know, if I'm cooking chicken, I'm cooking it correctly. Right. If I'm cooking meat, I'm cooking it correctly. If I'm doing this, I, I just wanted to know the classics and the right. science behind food which um, I think that helped a lot. Yeah, so I was going to say, so did you find that it complemented? Because a lot of the cooking that we do growing up, right, it's done from gut. Like I was actually just having a conversation with someone yesterday about they were asking me for a recipe for jollof. And I said, like, I've never had a recipe, you know, like you just cook from, I don't know, <laughs> intuition. You just have a sense, like, you know, you add your salt, you add, like, you know, if you taste it, it needs an extra um for that, this or that, you just add it. So I can't, like, write down a recipe recipe for you per se and so I'm sure sort of that's how you're cooking probably from you know intuition from all of that and so going to going into a professional course like how like what did you learn or how how do you think that sort of complemented what you already knew or you know consistency definitely oh got it yeah um, uh, very because once you start serving people your food or making Mm -hmm. products that you have to be consistent. So I learned very quickly when I started to write things down and to write recipes. Mm-hmm. And um, and because I'm, I'm always thinking about food, I was quite surprised that 10, actually my husband says about 15 years ago almost, I wrote about 50 recipes that I just wrote in books and just left it. Oh, and wow. I've never ever anything about it. So I started going over those recipes and correcting it. But what the school actually, what that, gave me was just teaching me consistency and and I was always plan and um, planning as well you know I always thought I was like the most organized person um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, and I like everything to be in their place and um, I am a tidy or neat um, mm. freak but um, it complemented that and it showed when I was at the school that um, I've been doing everything correctly mm. there are some cooking methods um, that I for instance um, when um, we cook onions, um, it, onions is so sweet. It's almost like sugary sweet right. syrup and that if you cook it slowly. So it also taught me patience because I find <laughs> um, <laughs> patience and just giving food time. And um, I never, ever knew I don't know how to cook omelette until I went to that school. <laughs> and I had to really? To <laughs> I had to learn how to do omelette. And I tell you something, it's the best omelette that I've ever tasted. <laughs> And it's got no color at all. So it, it absolutely complements. And um, when I do my jollof and I do the jollof stew and that, because yeah. as a serial, we eat our jollof with stew, I'm, I'm using some of the techniques that I've learned from there. Um, when I do, I'm doing mash um, yam, I'm using those techniques. When I'm doing like pea puree, for instance, I'm using techniques that I've learned. When I'm cooking fish, I'm using, because... I find also sometimes we tend to overcook things. Yeah. Yeah. So actually learn. So that kind of, that side of things, learning to cook things perfectly uh, and complements the African ingredients that I I, I use. And I was talking to them about all the ingredients and it was quite interesting, interesting actually that um, I use hibiscus quite a lot. Like when Mm. I make coolie and, um, and I was explaining to them that if you mix hibiscus and strawberry, it tastes like raspberry. So I was actually, um, almost like teaching them. That's good. You know? Yeah. Which I found really interesting because ideally I would have loved to just go to an African, um, chef and learn from them. But I did try around looking around, but I couldn't really find anyone that wanted to take anyone on. So I thought, well, maybe I need to go and learn on a completely different way and then yeah. apply those learned exactly. skills 
yeah, to African ingredients, which is what I'm doing now. Cool. Um, so uh, let's then talk about what you're doing now. So Maria Bradford Kitchen is sort of the name of your brand, your business. Can you tell people like what it what it is when you started and what are the different components of your of your business? Um, I started um, three years ago. I and since then, actually, I've created um, some product line because I, I also I think what I realized, especially with regards to the product line, uh, with African food, I, I don't care how fine dining it is. I think chili sauce is a must on the table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, you could you, we, I, I don't like salt on the table but I think chili sauce is something <laughs> yeah. ever gauge um some people like it really really hot some people like it mild um and 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 all of that so having chili sauce on the table always always helps and um with the drinks wine um goes really well um so, certain wines I suppose goes really well with spicy food and 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 African flavors and that but I realize cocktails work much better when it comes to African food and, um, and the drinks were actually created for that. And um, this is why when you're eating spicy food, um, satin wines actually make um, your, it, it makes the spiciness of the food in your mouth get worse or it, it doesn't go work really well with your palate. But if you're drinking sweeter wine or lager and that, it works so much better. Oh, with, interesting. Uh, so, so let's talk about, so for, so I'm familiar with the product line. So let's talk for those that are not familiar with it. So you've talked about um, the chili sauces and you've also talked about um, the drinks, right? So do you want to lay it out for people? So what are the chili sauces you have? What What's in them? And then what's the product line for um, the, the drinks? Yeah. So I have two um, chili sauces, which um, one is called Salon Fire. Um, Sierra Leone is um, fondly called. Yeah. Um, so one is really, really hot and they're both made with um, scotch bonnets, chili. Okay. And then the other one is um, milder and that's Salon Spark. And it's usually the spark before the fire. Yeah. And my, <laughs> my, my daughter and my husband came up with that name. Um, and then I have seven um, drinks, actually six, I've reduced it to six. I have six drinks. So I have Tumbi which is tamarind and um, cinnamon. So okay. tamarind in Sierra Leone, we call it tumbi. Um, and um, it's uh, a drink that is usually sold in plastic containers on the streets um, in Sierra Leone. But I've added a little bit of a Mary Bradford um, um, signature to it, which is the <laughs> cinnamon, because it's not usually made with cinnamon. But okay. um, I realized cinnamon works really well with tamarind. And it's absolutely, absolutely good with bourbon and whiskey. It's my Christmas um, bestseller. Um, oh, I've had, okay. Yeah, I've had people say to me, it tastes like um, mince spy. Um, <laughs> <and all that. laughs> it's very, very um, Christmassy. And um, I've also got lavender and coconut water. Um, the And that's called purple haze. Um, lavender, it's quite an English um, thing. Yeah. And um, I, we've got a, a, a farm near us that grows um, lavender. And I thought I wanted to bring an African or Sierra Leonean touch to it, which is coconut water, because I love coconut water. Mm -hmm. Usually when I'm in Sierra Leone, I'm down in so much coconut water. And I thought I needed to bring that yeah. um, that flavor. So mixing it with lavender works really, really well. Oh, nice. And that I did not know that. That's an interesting blend of mix. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Yeah. So lavender and coconut water, um, that works so well. And um it's floral and you have that coconut gentleness mm -hmm. to it. It's really nice and not too much floral because um otherwise you'll be overpowering. It's it always smell like your cupboard or, or something. But <laughs> Or washing up something. Yeah, <laughs> it, it goes really well with white rum or, or, or vodka, and, okay. and that. I've also got a mango um, sunshine. Mm -hmm. um, that's purely because um, mango is something that I love in Sierra Leone. Rainy season, it's like yeah. mango season. In oh, it, and the mango <laughs> is so ripe. And I managed to find someone that gets me the best mangoes. Unfortunately, they don't come from Sierra Leone, but um, <laughs> they are, they remind me of Sierra Leone, okay. and it smells like African mangoes, and which is what I use for my mango sunshine. Mm -hmm. I've also got um, 
um, blah, blah, blah. Um, Bisap. So I've got um, Passionately Bisap, which is hibiscus and strawberry. And that again is bringing um, Kent and Sierra Leone together because um, we have Bisap, which we sell on the street again. Yeah. And there's so much strawberry in Kent. I've, I'm surrounded by strawberry farms. <laughs> so I, I just thought I needed to bring those two flavors and they work so well together. And it, it's a, it goes amazingly well with um, 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 gin. And um, it goes really well with Prosecco as, as well. Oh. And uh, yeah, I've also got Spice Bisap. And um, this is what I used to drink in Sierra Leone. Okay. Um, because in Sierra Leone, we mix um, ginger and hibiscus together. And it's absolutely yum again. Um, the final one that I've got is Sierra Leonean ginger beer. But I've called it Nomaly. And this is my favorite, favorite, favorite <laughs> one. Because... Um, Normally, um, the name actually comes from the little figurines um, that Sierra Leoneans, before religion was introduced to Sierra Leone, mm-hmm. Sierra Leoneans used to worship this little figurines called Normally. Oh. And um, they're made out of limestone. And people used to believe that it brings them good luck, good health. And they plant it. They used to bury it in, um, in their farms and bury it underneath their houses for good luck and um, warding evil spirits away. And um, ginger beer has got the exact same color as these little figurines. Oh. And uh, slaves were found, slaves used to, that were taken from Sierra Leone, used to take these figurines for protection. And I just thought, um, we don't know about it and we don't really talk about it. And um, it's, there's museums all over Europe, especially Paris, that have these little figurines. And um, and I just thought it's a perfect representation of um, a forgotten um, Sierra Leonean um, heritage. And I wanted to bring that back into what I do. Um, so my ginger beer is called Normally. That is so, uh, I mean... <laughs> Like as you describe each product and the thought process you put into it, even with the naming and the um, and also the pairing, right, with different liquors, yes. there's there's a very um, I'm trying to think of the word. Like there's an intentionality about how how you've chosen to do what you do and 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 why, which I think you don't find that a lot. Like I personally haven't found that a lot as I think about sort of the growing African food space. So, I mean, I even think about when I went to your website just to, you know, sort of learn more about you. I love, like, I love it. I love the layout. I love the way you tell your story. Um, It's just easy to flow. And I actually was going to ask you, maybe I'm going off on a tangent here. Like what, what's the team? Are you doing this all by yourself? Do you have a marketing team? Like, how are you? Cause like, there's definite, it's very clear that yeah. you're not just cooking got, for cooking's have, sake, right? No, no, not at all, not at all. Um, I have got some, my my husband is um, um, a very, very capable businessman. <laughs> he helps me a, a lot. Um, he's been running his own engineering consultancy for over 10 years and, okay. and that. So he helps me a lot. And I think um, having that support of him, actually, because I find he's my biggest fan and um, he will wake up three, four o'clock in the morning and create a Canva post for me and just say, yeah, I think this would do well, really well on your, on your post. And um, him and my daughter are brutally honest when it comes to food. Um, Sometimes so painful because I'll get really excited about something and I'll just mix, mix and match some flavors together. And I say to them, can you try this? And if it's yuck, they will just tell you, oh my God, that's so hot. <laughs> like no care for my feelings. And, uh, and I, I need that. And I, I need that. But they also like, he just like help push what I do. But I have somebody that created my labels and my websites and that, and which I'm still working on, yeah. by the way, the website is still a work in progress. Because um, for me, I, I, I realize I, I'm bringing something, um, not many people know anything about Sierra Leone. Right. Um, I live in an area where there are not many black people. There's no black restaurants around. And I thought if I'm going to bring out um, anything about Sierra Leone or West Africa or anything like that, it needs to be perfect in every shape and form for people to accept it. It's definitely that, top that, notch. Like all the branding, like I looked at the labels on the products, like it's, it, it looks really, really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's, that's the thought process behind it. It's just this thing of making sure that um, 
Do you know, I, I, I don't know if you know anything about Waitrose and, and, uh, and Max and Spencer. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I'm when I'm whenever I'm talking to somebody about what I want to do, I want to say I want to imagine my food uh, on Waitrose and Max and Spencer's. Oh, it definitely hall. looks. It definitely looks like it fits right in there <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, so every single person that works with me, I'm always saying to them, "Have a look on Waitrose. Have a look on Max and Spencer's." <laughs> and um, I want to make sure that that's what we're working towards because I, I really think you know, and also people that really um, think about what they put in in their body and and food and food. They look at the packaging. They look at yeah. the label. They look at how you're presenting yourself and how you're presenting the food. Um, and it's uh, my products are new, so they need to stand out. And that's what I've always kind of wanted to, to, to do that. No, I think it looks it looks great. And I'm excited. So where um, so right now you're just retailing off of your website, the product. Um, so I'm doing off my website and okay. um, there's a farm shop near me also that sells my products. Okay. Um, so, um, with them, they contacted me a few years ago and asked me to do a food demonstration, um, for them, um, as a, as a chef. And I said to them, I can't do a food demonstration for you as long as, and it was a strawberry season. Mm. As long as I'm allowed to mix an African product with your strawberry. Um, I can't just do, I said, I have to be very, very much, um, it has to have a very, very African take on it, um. And if you're open to that, then I'll do it. And they said, yeah, yeah, we no, would love to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I did some food demonstration for them at their fest, food festivals. And after that, I started talking, I started selling at the um, farmer's markets and that. And they recently just said they would like to stock my products because they sell some of the alcohol as well. And I went to them and I just had a whole talk about what alcohol and what you can mix with it and what goes with what. And um, so they started um, stocking it. Um, I also have a shop in London. Um that stock my products as well. Um, it's funnily enough, it's my hairdressers. Um, she <laughs> it's my hairdressers salon. It's so busy all the time. And I went in there doing my hair and I realized people were just, just sitting down. Um, there wasn't anything to drink and she wasn't offering anyone and there was a space. So I said to her, <laughs> is it okay if I buy a free? That's a great, great idea. <laughs> I said, is it okay if I buy a fridge and put it in your shop and then we can make arrangements about you selling my product and you can get some money out of it? And she was like, oh my God, that's such a good idea. The f- as soon as I got home, I ordered a fridge, got to her shop. She sells more than the farm shop. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. Wow. She sells more than the- that's, and that's actually like an amazing I mean, if you think about it, you could actually probably start looking at, you know, black salons around yes. <laughs> around the UK. Yeah. That's like a brilliant like marketing strategy, actually. That's that's the plan. That's the plan. So mm-hmm. I want to um, sit down. So um, the plan is after my event, actually, to sit down and draw up a, a nice contract for her and anyone else that wants to come on board. I've contacted a few of the black salons. They're definitely thinking about it. And I want to draw up a contract and an agreement with them. So everyone's very, very clear about yeah. what their take is and what's happening. That's important for sure. Have, um, <laughs> A, a business relationship but that's the plan because I realize they sell so much more I also do farmers markets so I do farmers markets around um Kent um most weekends um which it's a really good platform for selling my events mm-hmm. and um as well and selling my products and also just um it's almost like an educational oh, thing right, as well about African mm-hmm. and, and um, African food in general because um Funnily enough, usually the minute I say my products are African inspired, they go, "Are you from Ghana?" <laughs> <laughs> Ghana again? No, I'm from <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. I hope. No, I mean, yeah, I think. <laughs> I say I usually say, um, it's a little bit down further down than Ghana. <laughs> but it's very close. We're the same people. We eat the same food. We cook it differently. We call it different names. Yeah. But yes. Yes. <laughs> Actually, this is probably good. This is probably a good time uh to take a short break. And then I think um when we come back, we'll sort of delve into Sierra Union food, right? So um you'll teach us what is Sierra Union food. Um and then 
we'll talk a little bit more about the other side of your business in the context of, you know, fine dining. So um, what's fine dining? We'll talk about fine dining in general and then in the African food context, particularly with what you do with events. Okay. Okay. You're listening to Item 13, an African food podcast. We'll be right back. Okay, so welcome back. Um, we're now going to go into more about what Australian food is is about. So, um, I I guess the closest I've had it, it probably is Australian food. Like we um, did a couple of events in uh, New York and DC earlier this summer mm-hmm. with um, a Fulani chef. So, yeah, uh, she's from Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, and so I guess. Obviously, that is Sierra Leonean food. We did I, mm-hmm. some of the food I'm trying to remember off the top of my head were like um, these fish balls we did. And there was a mafe yeah. and like pumpkin stew, which I remember telling her, I didn't even know that we had like we did pumpkin like in, in this part of Africa. I know when I lived in Southern Africa, like pumpkin was was big. But um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, so that was sort of my introduction to Sierra Leonean food. So if you could, you know educate the rest of us yeah. that <laughs> Definitely. Um, I will say for Sierra Leonean food, if you've missed any Sierra Leonean, um, the first dish, or in fact, I'll call it a national dish. A friend yeah. and I, who is also um, a, a chef, we were discussing whether we should have um, the cassava leaf plant, um, plant on our flag, just like the Canadians have. Because... <laughs> Cassava leaf is a national dish, mm. and uh, we, I, I think we're the only one in um, West Africa that eats cassava leaf. So um, we eat the roots, and then we eat the plants as, um, um, as, as well, the leaf as well. And the leaf is actually meant to be quite poisonous as well if it's not cooked properly. Yeah, so I actually was, I literally, this is so strange, because I literally was just reading, I don't know where it came from, there was an article, like literally this in the last 10 days, I'm sure, that was saying, I saw the headline, I was trying to, I was trying to skim through that saying cassava was po- like poisonous. And I was like, wait, what? And then I went in and started talking about the leaves and I was like, oh, I, I don't even know who wrote this. I don't have time for this. right. And then I never went back to it. But that's that's interesting. Yeah. So if, if it's not cooked properly, it really gives you terrible stomach pains and, uh. um, and, and diarrhea. But um, that's our national <laughs> dish. We just, we just love the challenge, to be honest. Yeah. So how do you cook it then? <laughs> Well, oh, cassava leaf is with so many um, stuff to it. So you can cook it with um, palm oil or you can cook it with oil. Personally, I like cooking it with coconut oil because um, I, I think it tastes so much better. Um, you so you start by really boiling the, the cassava leaf down. So And also we put something in it called ogiri, which okay. is fermented sesame seed. Um, like egusi, I think that, egusi in no, the Ghanaian context, or no? No, 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 it's not. So we have sesame seed, and oh, those is, are melon seeds. Okay, got it. Yeah, so sesame seed is boiled down, and then we put it in like palm stuff, and then leave it to rot. Um, uh. When it rots, it's got this this really nice fermented um, mm. um smell. It smells a bit similar to. Iru, which is um the locust, yeah. yeah. So it smells that same kind of rotting oh, smell, and that. Okay. but it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. It's really, really good. And so we start by boiling the cassava leaf with that. And if you have like smoked fish and all of that, you add it to that with some chili, and you really boil it until the cassava leaf it's it's cooked. And if you have meat, that's when you put all of that in. So you get the meat all nice and tender. And the cassava leaf goes from a bright green to a really dark green. And then you will add peanut butter um, to it. And then whatever oil you're using, whether you're using palm oil or using coconut oil, you will add it to it and um, cook it furthermore to get all the peanuts really nice, um, nicely cooked. And then you end it by adding um, some smashed up okra to it. So it's uh. used as a, so the okra is actually used as a thickening agent. Um, so it makes it really nice and thick. And um, if you're from like my mom is um, Madinga, but um, she grew up and she was born and raised in Bo, which is the southern province of Bo. And she speaks uh, of Sierra Leone, sorry. So she speaks 
Mende. So they cook like the Mende people. And the Mende people apparently in Sierra Leone are like top when it comes to cooking. Okay. Um, these green leaves, which we call plasas. Um, and you have to cook it. So there's li- virtually no liquid in it, just the oil and that that is settled on top. And you eat that with rice. But it's like, seriously, if you're a Cyril- uh, wait, I usually say if you're a Cerulean and you don't like a server leaf, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> there's a massive problem. <laughs> and the longer you leave it, the tastier it becomes. Seriously. Even I can my husband. feel like you. I can feel you like getting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting emotional about it. <laughs> my husband, who just started eating cassava leaf when he met me, yeah. will say to me, "Can we leave it tomorrow when we do like rice in the morning for breakfast, mm-hmm. and we can mix it with it? Yeah, and we call it kores. And I usually am like, "This, that's it." Man, you're never ever going anywhere because if you eat <laughs> breakfast in the morning, I can't take him anywhere. Absolutely can't take him. Anywhere. <laughs> but that's that's one of our, our favorite um, um, dish. We do have lots of other greens that we cook, okay. which um we cook like the pumpkin that you mentioned. Um, we also use cooked potato leaves. Um, and um, we have um, okra leaf. So we cook yeah. okra and then we cook oh, okra leaf. Yeah. And there's something that we call tola, which is on my Instagram page. I have got, I'm sure I found the, it's like from a tola tree or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the European name is, okay. but it's like a really nice sticky. When you put water in it, it's like okra, okay. but it's a brown powder. Um, and we... Yeah, we, we cook that um, as well um, and we eat that with fufu and, and all of that. But we do have days also where we eat certain things. Like um, when I was growing up, um, yeah. on I would say on Friday, we eat pottage. So and then um, Saturday we will eat um, fufu. So Saturday was okay. the only day that we eat fufu. And, and then what's, Sunday, like, we'll... what's your fufu? Because I've also found that across different, so the Congolese have their fufu, Ghanaians have their fufu. What do what's like your fufu? Oh, cassava. So okay. our, our fufu is cassava, and it's fermented also. Okay. So we they get the cassava and they grate it and then leave it to ferment. And got when it. it's got that fermented um, sour taste, and then we kind of we cook it as like a, a dough, make it into dough balls. Okay. Yeah. Um, but our fufu is mainly um, cassava. Okay. Um, and so that's what we'll eat on a Saturday. And then on Sunday, um, we'll eat either stew or jollof rice. So those are the only days, or when you go to parties, to be honest. <laughs> but those, <laughs> those are the only days that we'll eat jollof rice when I was um, growing up. Growing up um, yeah. yeah. Um, so the stew that we'll make, because we don't eat our jollof rice just plain on its mm-hmm. own. So I, I I find it really strange when I get invited to places. So when somebody talks to me about jello fries, because I'm, and it's only now actually that when someone says, oh, can you do jello fries? And they're not Sierra Leonean, that I don't think about the stew. Because yeah. if you say to a Sierra Leonean, come around for jello fries, there's definitely not just rice. It's jello fries That's and a stew with it. That's yeah. interesting because in Ghana, if... <laughs> Some people will say if you serve stew with your jollof rice, it means the jollof wasn't good and you're trying to hide the taste of it with the stew. Yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't eat our jollof plain or dry at all. In fact, we think it's too dry if it hasn't got anything. So um, our jollof has got stew that goes with it. And in that stew... I remember my mom used to put um, um, potato in it, not sweet potato, just uh, oh, um, like, um, potato. So you yeah. fry that and, and put it as part of the soup. Oh, wow. Make it, yeah, <laughs> uh, as well as um, that serve with the with the rice. And our jollof rice is usually got cabbage, like the white cabbage in mm-hmm. it as well. So we usually put white cabbage in it and sometimes carrots as, as well in the jollof oh, and then I need to try a, a proper Sierra Leone jollof that sounds actually really good so try a proper Sierra Leone jollof <laughs> never ever go back <laughs> so I guess I know where you fall on the debate on who has the best jollof yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> absolutely um 
So um, on the Sunday, we usually have those the, the jollof and the stew, and that stew, we'll eat some of it. And on Monday, my mom will add peanut butter to the stew and make it into peanut sauce. Oh. Yeah, and that's what we'll eat on Monday. So throughout the week, actually, you eat really light because yeah. um, weekend such a massive form of cooking and all my cousins and all my aunties and everyone turned up at home at the weekend because that's when you do the big cooking and um, everyone's sitting outside cooking, which I love, absolutely love the outside yeah. cooking. And we all eat together as that's well. Great. So, yeah. yeah. It's actually interesting as you were talking, like I hadn't even thought about this as like a, a thing that we were going to talk about, but as you were describing like the like Sierra Leonean cuisine I should say salon to be cool salon <laughs> um, cuisine I was thinking about how much um, green leafy like vegetables you eat yeah and the misconception maybe that like our food isn't healthy um, yeah, I and really how we we especially now I think how we can sort of capitalize on that as we try to bring African food to the wider masses, right? Mm -hmm. As as more and more people are focused on eating better, whether it's it's vegan or if it's from food allergies and so they're going gluten-free because there's a lot of our staple foods that sort of fit into Mm -hmm. this quote-unquote healthy (laughs) trend of eating that I think that there is room to capitalize on, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um, I'm always saying to people, saying that African food or um, is unhealthy, it's just when you don't have knowledge about it. Right. Because um, it's so much green, and um, and we eat balanced meals. Right. As well, exactly. Lo- our our greens will have so much in it. Like I described cassava leaf. How many European food that will have the fish, the protein, the right. peanut butter? And the good oils and all of that. And even yeah. palm oil, they keep going on about how bad palm oil is. But that not much investigation has been put into palm oil. But because when you read into how, what palm oil's got, like two tablespoons of palm oil, it's got more carotene than um, carrots um, and, and that. Yeah, um, and, I, and, and I think it's it's the the bad rap. I was reading somewhere the bad rap with palm oil also depends on where it comes from, right? Because mm. what I've read, like West African palm oil is different from from yes. uh, what comes out of Southeast Asia, for example, which is what most people know and like what usually gets a bad rap, right? Yes. Yeah. That's the one that gets the bad rap because they cut down all the plantations right. and 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 and, uh, and all the greens and the forests and that and the chimpanzees suffer and, and all of that. <laughs> and I don't I don't definitely don't agree with that one. And it's in everything. It's in chocolate. Yeah. It's in soap, it's right. in sharp gel and that. But the African palm oil is done on such a small scale production. It's mm-hmm. done mainly for food consumption and they don't cut down plantations or cut down bushes and cut down greens to plants to Africa. It grows within things. Like my grandma has got a palm oil plantation. And um, as a child, I do not remember that they had to cut down bushes right, to yeah. plant the palm oil. Um, my mom still processes, they get palm oil from the provinces for her into Freetown, which um, she sells like wholesale and, and, and all of that. But I never ever, and the palm oil is used, and as I say, we do it on such a small scale um, and, and all of that. And it's quite healthy. It's just, um, yeah. with, it's with everything. And I usually say to people, even olive oil, that they go on about how healthy olive oil is. <laughs> too much of it of course it's not good for you right. <laughs> orange. so it's just an excess of everything you know um that yeah. it's not it's not good for you but as we learn more about african food and we learn to appreciate our own food we realize uh, when people say i'm going on a diet i'm not eating african food i usually go like what are you talking about <laughs> Yeah, no, because I actually had a guest who um, also has the same feelings, right? And she said she actually lost, so she was going on a diet and her diet consisted of eating only African food and she lost like the weight that she wanted to lose and a good, like she was eat. she felt like she was eating, she was not depriving herself, but at the same time, she was mm-hmm. able to, you know, lose weight in a, in a healthy way while enjoying <laughs> her whole, so it's about eating whole, in her 
her perspective was that it's about eating whole foods and less processed yes. foods, right? So if I'm eating fufu, if I'm still eating my fufu and peanut stew, like fufu is mm-hmm. made from whole, you know, you're using whole cassava or in, in Ghanaian cases, a mixture of cassava and plantain. Um, peanut butter is good for you. Um, not a lot of meat, like if you're doing just mm-hmm. fish or whatever, you can eat, have all your good tasty yes. <laughs> African okay. food and still lose weight versus, you know, drinking down like all sorts of random juices. Hey, or... <laughs> thank you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Juicy, nice People usually go yeah. and juice and do all this funny, fatty diets and, and all of that. Exactly. You can still eat African food and lose. And it, 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 as with everything really, it's eating in moderation. You, right. you don't expect to eat for food 10 o'clock at night and go straight to bed <laughs> and anything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about eating in, yeah. in moderation and just um, eating well. But I just think you can get an absolute balanced diet from eating yeah. African food. Um, okay, so that was a tangent that I wasn't expecting us to go on, but that's okay. No, I think it's important um, as part of the discussion of African food in general. So really wanted to, so we've sort of covered the landscape of Sierra Leone and food. Now I want to sort of uh, go back to um, your business in specifically what you call, you, you know, you term the African fine dining company. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about what you mean by that. Like, what do you mean by... Like, why did you call it that, I guess? Um, I call it that because I called it that because um, offering um, um, plated food in an upscale setting and um, and um, having menus. Um, so usually the, the, the reason why I decided to go the, the fine dining route, for instance, is just um, I, I don't have anything against food warmers, but I realized lots of the parties that I was going to all the food were in food warmers. Yeah. And also the queue. Having to get <laughs> ready a decent event for food, I just think it's a no no. Yeah. Um, you know, you can still have um a, a nice plated or family style set- setting um without the food warmer. And also the fact that um we don't when it comes to rice, as Africans, I think we don't have respect or how bad um Rices, you know, when it's been left um, yeah. for a very, very yeah. long time, yeah, you know. And um, I decided that if I go down the route where every food that I serve is um, plated and um, it's served to the diner, um, not necessarily in a really formal, formal setting, but in just a little bit more upscale yeah. than the, um, then um, you know, just a new way. If, if you like to eat a new way that we're not, we're, we don't usually, right. a lot of the time I get um, people call me. Um, I have turned down quite a lot of jobs actually, where people insist they want food warmers <laughs> and I still don't do food warmers <laughs> and they just can't get it in their head that you can't still have a decent meal without having food warmer and you can still serve it in bowls and nice dishes. Right. And, that. and I just wanted to focus on just using nice cutleries and nice plates and, and nice serving setting, plate, plate setting and all of that. And just having a, a good atmosphere because I think um, the setting that you eat your food add to the whole food experience. And I just yeah. want that my food to have that experience that goes with it. No, I think that's great. And I think the fact that, you know, you're sticking to your guns and like knowing who, who your customer is and not just accepting, um, cause that also probably gives you peace of, peace of mind in the, oh, absolutely. In the long run. So, absolutely. but then do you think, um, how does that affect your price point then? Right. Cause if you're serving, um, cause I think that might also be, uh, a factor in the community, right. Where people are thinking, yeah. um, yeah. They also don't want to go beyond a certain price point. And I've had these discussions with some people in London, yeah. especially where it's like, I can, this mentality of quote unquote, I can make this at home. So why are you yeah. charging me X? And so not understanding sort of what goes on behind the scenes in terms of your additional overhead costs. Yeah. Um, and then what it takes to give you that experience, right? And so people think, oh, if I if you if I remove X, Y, and Z things, then maybe the price will go down to closer yeah. to what the expectation is for quote unquote food from home. Yeah. Um, so and I'm sure you get that a lot. I do get that a lot. Um, 
I, I absolutely do. But the people that get it, get it. And, and that's one thing that I've been really, really grateful for. The people mm. that get it, they absolutely get it. Because um, I am expensive. That's what a lot of people will say. Um, yeah. Maria Bradford is very expensive. But I will break down my costs usually and say, um, for instance, if you ask me to do a wedding um, for 150 people, for every 10 people person, there should be one uh, um, waiter. So I'm having around 15 waiters serve this yeah. food um, to you. Um, and um, I'm having kitchen help and, and all of that. And that adds to the cost, of right. course. But what you are getting is the fact that you don't have to queue for your food and you eat from a really, really nice plate yeah. and you eat um, with very nice napkin and um, and you you drink from a proper wine glass, <laughs> you drink from a proper glass and a really nice place setting. That's what you get. And the people that get it, and I realize I'm not going to be able to challenge those people that do um, the um, food warmers where you use plastic papers and plastic yeah. cups and um, plastic and disposable stuff. I'm not I'm not going to compete with them um, at all. And that was never ever the intention. Right. Which is- I set up, I decided I'm going to go down the fine dining route where, um, and, and personally, I absolutely hate the fact that we just don't aim high when it comes to our food. You're listening to Item 13, an African food podcast. We'll be right back. Yeah, and I also think, yeah, that, and sometimes I also wonder if, and maybe that's exactly what you're saying that we don't think we don't aim high when it, when it comes to our food because the same person would probably pay the same if they wanted like a French a French um, meal or whatever for their wedding. But because it's, you know, food that I know, like, why should I be paying um, X, you know? No, so that's yeah. great. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's that. And it's good for um, the diversity of experiences also, right? So, you know, so people that do the, you know, the mass scale um, heat warming thing have their place in the market. And then you also sort of are creating your own niche in the marketplace, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And I have people that absolutely love that. Um, I have, I get hired for private events for 10, 15 people. Mm-hmm. The last events that I did um I think it was around July was for 15 people and somebody just wanted that service where everything she, she he wanted his guests to be able to sit down and enjoy a nice African yeah. meal um served to him and which is what he got and um him and his guests absolutely appreciated it um and usually when I speak to people I'm like would you not like to be sit th- to be able to sit down and <laughs> jell off in a really really nice place <laughs> nice cutlery and drink your ginger beer in a really nice glass <laughs> would you not like that that's what you get and I will yeah. break down the cost for you and you'll see that I'm not trying to be um expensive or necessary right. um there's cost attached to the waiters that are going to serve you and 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 and, and all of that so if you want that service, then I'm here and I'm ready to offer it. Um, and and uh, and the ones that want it, absolutely go for it. I've done weddings um, in London for over 100, 200 people. Um, and the bride was absolutely happy. The mother, not so much, didn't quite get it, especially. And the, <laughs> other, thing that I, <laughs> the other thing that I do also is the, the taste of menus. Yeah. Is, I, I I like eating very, very little. So I wouldn't call it tapas because I, I really think it's not tapas. Mm. It's, it's like tapas style, but it comes in a taste of form where people get to sample different parts of different African things in yeah. one sitting, if you if you like. So, um, and I've had brides that have gone for that, like a whole six course um, mm. meal. And you get people that are eating more like that. And I get with Europeans when I get hired, I get people that hire me that don't know anything about African food at all until the day they come for food tasting, Um, which it's amazing because then it's me teaching them my heritage. It's me teaching them about culture. It's me teaching them about African ingredients and, um, and then taking them through that journey, which is absolutely, they, I get so excited about that. Um, and 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 I, and I get excited when African people like what I do because um, 
you know, it's um, appreciating. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, appreciating I, and love. I mean, I. It still, it shouldn't, but it still surprises me. Like when people are trying some sort of African food for the first, for, from whatever part of the continent for the first time. Because I always say this, and I'm sure people have heard me say this to death, but. For the second, for how big the continent is and the variety of food that we offer, like for for people not to have even experienced it is like mind boggling to me. And sometimes <laughs> I'm like, there's a lot of things I want to do in the African food space. And you and I have talked offline a little bit about it. Um, mm-hmm. But sometimes I get discouraged because I'm like, oh, do I really, you know, should I keep doing this or do something else? And then when I hear a story about someone has an like this is their first time trying African food I'm like okay this is why I'm doing this like how can you how can you in 2019 not like there's 50 plus African countries how can you not have tried anything after it's like insane to me um you still you still meet those people that never ever ever had anything African Thing, food before yeah. they don't even know what jollof rice and that's for me that's the thing because jollof rice is one of the most popular african food yeah um, and what i usually start with have you tried jollof rice and when they say no i'm like oh my god <laughs> and, and it's, think, it's mind-boggling especially in big cities right so you can't even fault like rule you know people and um, who've not had access which is just like if you live in a big city yeah <laughs> it's it's still my so mind-boggling to me um and one of the things I also wanted to ask, like, are you just doing Sierra Leonean food? Are you doing a fusion? Like, what's what's the kind of food that you're you're serving? I will call. I would. I do fusion. So okay. for me, um, what I try to do is just using. I, I tend to say I do West African fusion. Okay. Because um, I find we we all use our ingredients are quite similar. Right. Yeah. Um, we might use it in different ways and um, and we call it different names and, and that. But um, sometimes the, the end things I'm sure taste really, really similar. So what I'm trying to do is just take African ingredients that like um, the scallops that you see on, on my Instagram page that I've done some Igusi um, crunch with. It's just trying to do use that those African ingredients that we'll probably just use for one specific thing, which is like doing fufu soup with it and just using it in a completely different um, way um, that works. Um, and using it with ingredients probably that we'll not not usually use it with, or maybe breaking down like I usually do like a banga um, sauce, which yeah. I serve with either chicken or fish, depending on what um, stock I've made to to cook the whole banga stuff with. Um, and um, I, I think just I would say I do quite a lot of Afrofusion stuff. I do do the traditional thing where I do cassava leaf because I think there's certain flavors and certain um, national or heritage food, I, I really think that shouldn't be touched or okay. shouldn't be broken down. Yeah. Like when it comes to cassava leaf, I cannot think of any other way to break cassava leaf down. <laughs> yeah. I think and, and our, just based I, on the way you talked about it, I'm sure that you know. <laughs> <laughs> our ancestors did a very perfect job of just putting <laughs> the right ingredients in it. I just think it should not be messed with. It should be left exactly as it is. And um, so those are the things that I wouldn't break down. And, um, you know, we do egusi soup. I'm sure Ghanaians do egusi soup because I know Nigerians do as well. So, you can do egusi sauce and that, but we put like sorrel, like the, the green sorrel, we, yeah. we put that to our egusi e- e- soup and that. So there are certain things that I feel like it should stay the way it is. There's nothing you can do with fufu, to be honest. You can use yam to do all sorts of things. But that taste of fufu, maybe you can do stuff with it, but I haven't discovered it yet because I'm so enjoying how my mom cooks it and how the traditional methods that are used to cook it. But using hibiscus and using other African ingredients to create things like um, um, I do lots of croquet using yam or cassava, depending on what flavor I'm putting into it. Because I realized cassava works really well with Parmesan. Oh. Um, cheese. Yeah, absolutely. Cassava, it's got this, no, cassava is quite creamy and mild. And uh, and um, Parmesan is just got this really nice um, saltiness to it yeah. that adds such a beautiful taste to to cassava so i tend to do um a vegetarian um cassava croquet with parmesan um uh, um, uh, as well with 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 that and 
you know, we have um, suya or kankankan. We call it kankankan, to be honest. In oh, Nigeria, really? I think. Yeah, Nigeria yeah. call it uh, suya. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is um, grilled, some sort of grilled meat with a spicy. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. So we call it kankankan, which is street food, and we do it with meat and, and all of that. So I, I, use, um, I use those spices. So I make those spices and I use it on meat. I use it on cauliflower steak. Because sometimes when I do events and I have vegetarians, I'll use it on cauliflower and it makes a, a mean cauliflower steak um, with butter beans smashed. Mm. <laughs> we, I'm like getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> we we cook lots of butter beans and pulses like oh, black eyed okay. butter beans and those yeah. cheese, um in Sierra Leone. So I tend to use those pulses quite a lot for different things and to make um um different um stuff with it. But I would say I do quite a lot of Afrofusion stuff. Okay. Well, that's yeah. that's that sounds if anyone like it's lunchtime here, so I'm like listening to all of this and I'm like, oh god. <laughs> Uh, um one of the things I wanted one of the experiences I wanted you to share was um especially you know um running sort of events like this on a consistent basis you know you talked about consistency earlier um you know you do a lot of that in England and I'm sure you've done at home and uh, you said in Liberia also I wanted to share for the so that people sort of get a sense of what it's like to to run especially as you start getting 200 plus people I know you had an experience in Sierra Leone so I went to Sierra Leone to run um, an event, one for, for a wedding, actually, a wedding um, cocktail hour. And um, the cocktail hour was for a thousand people. And I oh did my. drinks um, for that, which went really, really well. Um, the second one I had to do um, was um, few, the day after the wedding, the bride wanted to do an event for her f- friends. Um, and that was about three you know, up to 300 people. We started oh with 150 actually. <laughs> and a few days to the event, I was told it might be 300 people. Oh uh, bearing in mind, I've taken quite a lot of things um, um, to Sierra Leone for this um, event. But the the first thing that got me, here I'm used to working in commercial kitchens, which is mm-hmm. all fancy and set up. And um, the hygiene issue is top notch. Um, you know definitely when you stack in fridge in a in a home or commercial k- kitchen that the meat product comes at the base and all the the greens goes at the top so you don't have um, food contamination and everything turned up in the kitchen and um, they had this um, <laughs> fly catcher that was hanged in the kitchen and it looked like they haven't cleaned it for days and I was literally like pulling my hair and then we had um, the oven. So the <laughs> oven gas <laughs> was a gas oven and you have to press lots of buttons and hold it for ages before oh that God. comes on. And when it comes on, it's not like the full fan oven where um, you get heat the whole way. It's just at the top <laughs> of the, the, the oven. And I had to serve, in all this condition, I had to serve six course meal. Wow. And if I hire a kitchen assistant here, so if I say I want a kitchen, uh, um, uh, not just so someone to wash up, if I say I want to hire like an assistant chef for the yeah. day or for a couple of days, if I have very big events, mm-hmm. they know exactly what to do. What if to I do, say yeah. them, pan fried chicken for me, they know exactly what to do. If I say, can you finally dice this for me? They know what to do. I went to Sierra Leone not thinking about any of this. <laughs> Just saying to people, can you chop this parsley for me? And they will cut it like they cut potato leaf green. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Or you say to someone, um, can you grill this for me? And they will put oil in the frying pan. Yeah. And like, no, that's not what I mean. So I ended up being the chef. Oh um, just being absolutely everything. I couldn't even ask. One of the, um, the, the the dishes, I couldn't even ask someone to season nothing for me because also I realized people eat way too much salt. Right, yeah. And um, the fact that I wasn't using Maggi was also a massive... Right. Oh my God, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> I, oh, it was. It was a big thing to everyone that was helping me, the fact that I wasn't using Maggi. 
and I had lots of different flavors and and spices and that mm. that I was using and um and stock that I was making and all of that. It was so strange. I remember just the final <laughs> thing, just getting ready, and somebody said, "Oh, you didn't even add maggi to that." I'm like, "Oh, oh my, my god, god, do not add maggi to my food." And <laughs> it's just, uh, but it's just not not being able to get yeah. like, and and also do you know, um, Sierra, Sierra Leone is not as develop as um, probably Ghana and and that we still have a society that doesn't really respect um people doing stuff with their hands no, um say goodness, chefs yeah. and um people don't leave school and say I want to be a chef I want to go yeah, and learn I mean to- I think I think there's still some of that across across the region not even the continent really where I mean I think because of popular like food tv shows it's becoming more respectable but I still think uh, unless you're sort of on top there it's there's still a sense that um yeah school is school is the first Uh, place to go it is um and you find people only think about going to catering school or learning to cook if they haven't had um enough education right forget that you do need that education to be able to apply to food just like any other job yeah Uh, you know um you, you 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 do need that um education to be able to to do all of that so it's um it, it was um a challenge an absolute challenge and and uh, um but i managed to 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 do it and serve six course meals and that's crazy uh, <laughs> everyone was happy i did it's what what they got but i ended up having to literally be covering everything that's, and that's... it was one of the hardest things that i've ever done because i've never had that experience here you know i've done weddings big weddings here yeah but i've always people that know exactly what right so it's uh, you need to have the right team right to be able to pull off uh, oh you absolutely do you absolutely do um when i had um when i've had events here in fact you know i've got an event coming i will hire um an assistant chef for the day that will help me out um i will make quite a lot of the stuff but it's just when it comes to um finishing off stuff i if i'm starting plates or I'll do one plate and I'll say can you continue and do it this way or can you line yeah. this up and do it? so you definitely need that team and you need people that understands um you know what you're trying to put out there and 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 have respect for the flavors that you're putting out there as well I agree no so uh, actually when you're talking about the work you're doing in Sicily and made me think about um if you were interested in, well, I hopefully like Sierra Leone is unique in, in, you know, in certain aspects, but if you would be interested in doing work outside of the UK, are you interested in um, events or, you know? Yes. Um, I, I'm absolutely, before, a few years ago, I was actually, when I did the wedding, before I did the wedding in Sierra Leone, I have to say I was getting very excited about doing an event in Sierra Leone, like a, a supper club. Yeah. And that. I'm still thinking about stuff like that. Maybe I will. But um, I just need the, it doesn't need to be top notch. And I'm not saying it needs to be like a fancy or a right. restaurant. Or, or kitchen is called the gadget, latest gadgets or anything like that. But um, just somewhere where you'll be able to cook food safely and not poison anyone. <laughs> 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 because that was the thing that was really stressing me out. Because um, um, food, um, food safety hygiene is just embedded in my head. Yeah. Like every years I top up on on my food safety hygiene and allergies and that and mixing things and just you know I know we don't really talk about uh, think about allergies and stuff in in, in Africa because um um as far as we're concerned no one is allergic in Syria <laughs> <laughs> to anything so <laughs> I'm usually quite conscious of that yeah. that when I'm doing stuff if I know that I'm doing peanuts with satin things. I don't want it to mix with the rest of the other stuff. Yeah. If I'm not, um, I'm doing my vegetables. I don't want the chicken to be near my vegetables because I know that it doesn't matter how much I wash that vegetable, it's never going to be able to get that um, chicken um, contamination off. So yeah, just as long as there's a space where I'm not poisoning people, then I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the fact that I did get to cook outside quite yeah. a lot and using um um wood and um the the coal pots and and all of that yeah no way mm. i missed that that was quite good <laughs> so 
So then, like, what's what's next for you? Like, what what's next for Maria Bradford's Kitchen? Are you, I don't know, expanding product lines, a restaurant, maybe? Restaurant, definitely. Um, so I'm I'm planning to do more events and um and try to collaborate a lot more with people. Okay. And uh, just trying to grow the brand because I think people want to come and eat somewhere where they know that that person's got a bit of a reputation for doing. Yeah enjoy when it comes to food so I want to grow um, my reputation in terms of what I want to achieve in you know presenting beautiful African food a beautiful um, Sierra Leonean food and, and that so I want to have a reputation for doing that and the only way that I realize I'm going to be able to do that is do more events and um, collaborate a lot more with a lot of people and then the end game is to have my own restaurant Awesome. Yeah, because there's not a lot of um, brick and mortar um, African restaurants, you know. And so actually I had a friend who was visiting London um, a couple of weeks ago and had sent me a message asking for recommendations for African restaurants to go to. And a lot of the people I thought of like have pop-ups only. And so if for the week that he was there, they didn't have a pop-up situation, then he wasn't going to be able to to try it. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of by like financing being the biggest barrier, um, yes. but it would be... Is the, biggest, is the biggest barrier, but also for me personally, finance is a big thing, but finding the right location. Um, it needs to be somewhere where... Cause I, I don't just want to do, there are lots of um, African restaurants, but it's usually, you know, there are a few shacks, I, I usually call them, and um, there are a few proper places, but it's still kind of just doing, you know, plodding by and doing stuff. I want to do something, not m- quite, I don't know if you know about Ikoi. Yes. Yeah. In London. So not Ikoi. So I want to do something that maybe I step down from Ikoyi because um, I have been to Ikoyi. Um, they're doing an amazing job, but I couldn't relate. Yeah. It. So I, it's funny. I was just literally just having that conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago. So she just been to Ikoyi recently. And and I've been, I, I think, I don't know when it was last year. I think I was oh, two years ago now. Wow. Time flies. Um, maybe it was two years ago. I was at Ikoyi also. And um, it's great for what it is, right? Um, <laughs> but it's not like yeah. I, I have a hesitation to hold it up as like the African dining Thanks. concept in London, you know? Yeah. So I couldn't really relate to it. It's not a place where if I wasn't doing food, I would say to someone, do you know what? I know this really nice um, African food joint that I want to take you right. to. It right. is not. So I kind of, this is why I said I want to do something, step down from Ikoyi, where um, it will still have all the fancy stuff that you get when you go to a decent restaurant, but it will very much represent what Africans Yeah, because I think um, the closest that I've experienced for that, like for what I think you're describing is um, in Lagos, there's a restaurant by um, called Knock by Alara. Um, and I think they have, for me, the closest to, because I've also considered, I shouldn't say considered, it's still in my consideration set. We'll see, we'll see what happens in the next few years. But I'm also very interested in in opening a fine dining, African fine dining restaurant someday. And so like, but that's part of why I'll go to a place like Ikoyi just to you know, see what, yeah. what, what's happening exactly. there. Um, and so for me, the closest, so I wouldn't call knock like fine dining, like it's probably upscale casual. Mm-hmm. Um, is what I would call yeah. it, but it's yeah. it's probably the closest. I think they have innovative. It's a condensed menu. It has innovative food, and it's sort of mm-hmm. pays for me homage or homage to um, different parts of the continent. So it's not exclusively West African. You will see okay. like yam and oxtail. There's a play on yam and oxtail. So we're going to Southern Africa. Then you'll have okay. your sorrel, which is like West African. So it's a good, you, you can check it out online just to see their menu yeah. and like sort of ha- yeah. what they've done there. I think it's a really interesting, um, the most interesting that I've seen anyway um, of what I would probably want to do down the road but But yeah definitely so for me it will be something that um as I say step down it would definitely be something a a place also where when you eat and if you want to buy um a pack of fonio which I'm a big advocate for fonio 
you want to buy a pack of Fonio because you've had Fonio and you really like it and you want to go home and experience it, it's a place where probably next door or within the same building where you'll be able to buy that packet of Fonio. And um, if you want to buy my drink because you've had a cocktail, right. um, to go home and enjoy that, you can buy it and take it home. So it's that kind of um, um, place that I would like to 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 have. Yeah, and cool. also, you know, for me personally, I think it's also about I would like to have somewhere where I'll be able to invite other um, chefs from all over the continent, really, the African continent. Yeah. We might have a day where it will just be Ghanaian food being served. As long as they kind of work, um, that person work within the same Mary Bradford kind of concept of right. having a tasty, well-presented African food. I'm all up for it. So because um what I what I find um as an African chef, um you it's almost, you know, you don't have that many restaurants that you can go into. We're not very friendly. Um I've written to so many different <laughs> African restaurants within London, trust me, just to say, you know, I would like to talk to the person that could right. like have a, we're not very open about encouraging each other to really um, um showcase it is, it is rather unfortunate, um, except if you know someone, um, maybe that's how it is all over the place. But um, I get so much joy if I just pick the phone up and call like a European um, place and say, would you like to experience, um, yeah. would you like to have a conversation about what I do? Um, I'm an African food chef and um, this is what I do. And they're more open to say, yes, come down, let's have a chat. Oh, wow, yeah. that's amazing. But if you do the same phone call with an African restaurant, they wouldn't even reply. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's unfortunate, and it's 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 um no, it's interesting because when you talk like that's in terms of even having I'm going to go back to what you're talking about with like having um a I'll call it pantry for lack of a better term, like where you yeah. sell. So I like it's interesting to me, like I have thought about that but more in the context of selling like gome african yeah. um mm. african food yeah. products that's, that's nice. uh, yeah. and so yeah i mean like i i think that you're thinking in the personally like not that i'm <laughs> but i like the way you're thinking and i'm like no i think i think yeah, we need, we need uh, more people to be shooting Absolutely. absolutely. Higher, right? And so. Absolutely. Because I, I really, really feel like if we don't push ourselves and put our stuff out there, somebody else is going to come and do it. That's got yeah. I'm like, I Africa. literally, <laughs> like just yesterday, I was like, I saw plantain chips on Amazon and I was like, <laughs> oh. and not just like someone is selling their plantain chips. It's like branded. It's Amazon plantain chips. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm like, how have we gotten to the point where... <laughs> I mean, Amazon is its own thing, but like how I feel like, you know, I'm going to go off on a tangent side, but you know, when I see stuff like that, I'm like, I bought it because I want, I saw it and I wanted to try it. Um, just, you know, for my own uh, quote unquote research purposes, but it's just like, how, how did we get here? Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know. But I, I'm, and also it's just, it's, you know, we keep encouraging each other, like, um, yeah, this is completely um, off track, but um, I don't know if you know the lady Zoe from Ghana Kitchen. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know Zoe. I've never met her. I've never spoken to her. She follows my page. But um, quite recently, she, she did a TED Talk and um, with her actually contacting me or talking to me, she decided to talk about me, which I thought was amazing. It's yeah. just not something that I'm, I'm used to happening. And um, because sometimes you find when people are doing food and you send them an email, because I like if the minute I see somebody doing African food, I'm all up for it. I'm usually right. a, a DM or send a saying, hi, oh, amazing job. Because I, I just think if we're not um, pushing our own stuff and bigging each other up, seriously, somebody else is going to come and take Yeah, and I, I mean, I yeah. think I, I also think there's there's room for uh, for everybody, you know, yeah. and so like there's no, there's uh, it's a health, some healthy competition is good. Um, I always say, 
I don't know who who said this, um, but you know, when when you think of when you think your idea or whatever has been is, is out there has been there, like just go to the grocery store and see the number of brands that sell water or you know. So there's yeah. there's room for everyone and um I think you're right in that we should be it's encouraging good. and building up the community versus absolutely it's also good for the end user, really, the customer, because um it kind of makes us once more. Um, as uh, you know, if I was um, 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 uh, just buying or looking for a chef or looking for Ketra to do an event for me, I want somebody that challenges my palate, somebody right. that challenges my food thoughts, somebody that makes me think about, um, you know, what I'm putting in my mouth. And um, and I, and I think as consumers, people really need to start like asking these questions and challenging people that do these foods and just say, you know, and just wanting more. We need to want more from 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 us, really. They need to want more from us because the more they want, the more we challenge ourselves and the more we want to be better and we're not just stagnant because um, this is not just about the continent now. This is about us bringing ourselves out here and just yeah. saying, you know, we have good food, we have healthy food, we have super foods, we have amazing food. Right. We can actually feed ourselves and we can survive on just eating our own food and being really healthy and having a balanced diet. Yeah, totally agree. I feel like we're on the same page. <laughs> so it's just on food. <laughs> I agree. Um, so before we transition to sort of the rapid fire segment, can you let people know where they can find you online, where they can buy your products, whether it's social media, website? Yes. What have you? Um, you can buy my products from my um, website, um, uh, mariabradfordkitchen.com. Um, you can DM me on my Instagram page, mariabradfordkitchen.com also. And um, um, there are a few shops in the UK that sells um, my products when it's in Kent, in Faversham, <laughs> when it's in, it's in London. But ideally, you can send me a message on Instagram and I'll refer you to um, either of these places. Or you can just go on my website, which is www.mariabradfordkitchen.com. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to do a quick um, rapid fire questions. They're probably, let's say, three to five questions. Um, nothing too serious to think about. I know how you feel about your love, so I'm not going to ask you about that. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you about Jalop. That'd be a Jalop war. Ghana versus Caribbean. I know. We're not going to go there today. Because um, now I have a feeling that at least you've sold it really well. So, like, I don't know where I stand anymore. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. So, here we go. Uh, coffee or tea? Ooh, coffee. Um, dine in or take out? I feel like dining. I knew it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just oh, it's crazy because um, I should really say take out, but I'm just so obsessed with my kitchen that I'll probably say, oh, I can just whip something up quite yeah. quickly. <laughs> um, do you prefer starter or dessert? Dessert. Okay, <laughs> I used to check I'm dessert good. menu first before anything. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite kind of dessert to have? I love chocolate. Oh. I love I love chocolate Anything and that chocolate. chocolate Anything chocolate. And the more chocolate, the better. <laughs> yeah. And I love crunchy stuff as well. Okay. Like, um, you know, if you have in any crumbly stuff, I, oh. I like all of them. Cool. Um... And then who's your dream? Actually, yeah, we didn't cover. Who's your dream African chef to cook with? Ooh, I forgot his name, actually. There's a guy in um, in France that I keep an eye on his um, page. Oh. Um, yeah. And I have written to him a couple of times. He's okay. probably fed up with it. <laughs> <laughs> Because I keep saying, I would really like to come to your kitchen. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> right. So it's a mystery African chef in France. <laughs> so, and then, and then I'm here to complete the sentence. This year, I'm going to try and eat more. Mm, more greens. More greens. Good. Good. All right. Yes. That's it. See, that was easy. 
Yeah. <laughs> I had to think about it. I think we're going to try more, more work, more chocolates. Yeah. Chocolate is often good for you. Can we get for you in dark chocolate, they say? I love dark chocolates. I don't like milk chocolates. So. Yeah. And see, that's good for you. So you could, always, you could also eat more of dark chocolate as well. Yes. What you say is good for you. You're talking about me just having one or two things. I'm talking about sitting down and eating a whole block of. <laughs> I'm sure, that's not good for you. Okay, yeah. then maybe it's moderation, <laughs> like we talked about. Yes, <laughs> I need to learn that when it comes to. Absolutely. Well, this has been great. Like I know we scheduled like an hour. We've gone way over our time, but I think it's because we we just. Um, like I enjoy these conversations. I think it was a, a very easy going. It was easy to talk to you, and um, I think we agree. You know, we have the same ideas about the African food landscape, and it was great to to learn about Australian food and your ideas and fine dining. So it was real. It was real pleasure to chat with you, and um, all the best with with you know with growing your brand and with everything else that you have planned going for you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Item 13, an African food podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. To keep up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Item 13 Podcast. Thank you.